Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 614. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 4th, 2020. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're watching or listening if you listen to the podcast. Before we get too far into the show, we do ask that you like us on Facebook or YouTube. It helps with the algorithms. It makes us even more infamous. Infamy. That's the word I'm looking for there. We're not really famous. We kind of, oh, it's those guys again. That's We, we understand. It's no big deal. Uh, comment on the show. We got lots of comments on our last show. We appreciate that. We read it. Um, a lot of people ask follow-up questions. I saw George at answering some follow-up questions. If you've not subscribed yet to the show, this is your opportunity to click on that red rectangle and finally subscribe to our show. We have finally, George, and for some people, this is going to be a big number, we have six thousand subscribers i know i'm just i'm blown away not six million or 60 million but we've got six thousand george that's a lot for an anglican podcast in the middle of nowhere so did i mention we have a podcast if you go to the show notes on youtube you'll find that we have a link to a podcast so you don't have to watch us you can just listen to us how's it going george Exciting times. We got a call on Sunday night that our daughter Claudia was in the emergency room in Seattle. And God help me, the first thing I thought was, oh no, she got in a fight with police. But thankfully or sadly, she had a bicycle accident. Uh, she was riding her. She has a job and therefore she has to go to work and therefore she's tired at night. Therefore, she's not one of these kids protesting because. She may have social sympathies with the protesters, but she has, has got to earn a living. That's right. And she has a mountain bike. And for Sunday afternoon, she likes to go into the parks around Seattle. And she took a spill. And today, uh, she's going to the dentist because she may have uh, damaged her front teeth. It was a really hard spill. So Susan and I are basically keep staying by the phone. And and because uh, we told her. You know, kids, you know, she's our independent child. She wants to pay for everything. And I said, don't be cheap. We'll pay for the dentist. You know, this is not something you fart around with. You oh, you yeah. get it right. <laughs> Look like somebody from the 30s again. Yeah. He, uh, dental care is very important in 2020. So, yeah, we, we and uh, we keep her in her prayers. Recovery from a bike accident is a... Uh, it's it's strenuous because when you hit the when you hit the ground we call it hit the tarmac, uh, you scrape, you uh, roll, and basically you sacrifice your body or your bike. And it sounds like uh, her body went went. Uh, oh, yeah, she bought that bike. She's not going to do it, let anything happen to that. <laughs> Daddy didn't buy that. She bought that. <laughs> All right, so uh, people are going to wonder where I am. We are outside of Grand Island, Nebraska. Uh, we're no longer in Montana. We're no longer in Wyoming. We've been almost everywhere. No, we didn't go to Montana. Wyoming, Colorado, uh, and other places. We've kind of taken a week here in Nebraska before we head off to Madison. Um, been a great, f uh, fun tour. Well, what is there to do for a week in Nebraska? Watch corn grow. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, we're right outside of Grand Island. I don't know if um, our viewers know this. In 1980, Grand Island was wiped off the face of the earth by six tornadoes in one day. Uh, this cumulus cloud formed right above the town, and these tornadoes formed. They were going counterclockwise, which is the opposite of how tornadoes are supposed to go, and poof, you know, National Guard shows up a day later, and this town rebuilds itself. And it's a healthy little town. Now it's uh, supported by a farming community that obviously does corn. That's the big thing out here in Huskerville. Um, but it's it's a neat little town. There's several churches that seem to be vibrant. Uh, large uh, immigrant culture to help with the farming. It's a it's a beautiful little place. But the only exciting thing to do here is watch Anglican Unscripted or watch corn grow. That's that's all there is. George, it's been a bad news week for the, our friends in Sudan and Nigeria. Um, violence continues to grow. We have 
actual violence and killing in cathedrals in Sudan. Uh, bring us up to date. Well, we had a story by a contributor from the Sudan who wrote the story uh, from the scene mm-hmm. um, in one of the cathedrals in South Sudan. This is not the north where there's the Khartoum government. This is South Sudan. And South Sudan's in the midst of a civil war, which you could describe as tribal, the Nur versus the Dinka and their various tribal allies. Well, let's back, well, let's back up just a little bit. North and South Sudan divided over religion. This is tribal within South Sudan. North Sudan is predominantly Arab uh, and mixed Arab African. South mm-hmm. Sudan is African. South Sudan is predominantly Christian. North Sudan is pre- overwhelmingly Muslim uh, with Christian pockets where mm-hmm. there's still the, uh, the, the Nuba Mountains, for instance, is a Christian area in South Sudan where the Khartoum government is waging a war of genocidal extermination against the Christians. Uh, why? Well, there's oil under them, their hills, yeah. and uh, you've got to get rid of the pesky Christian villagers to uh, drill that oil and uh, fund the government. Well, there has been co- regime change in Khartoum, uh, and so the government in Khartoum is uh, getting a little nicer, but it really hasn't percolated down to the ground level where the Christians are still being persecuted. But in South Sudan, we have tribal war where the the Khartoum government for years would send arms and money to the different tribes once independence was granted in South Sudan to make trouble. And this past week, a uh, gunman burst into a cathedral, shot it up, uh, killed uh, one of the deacons at the altar. Uh, the final tally, uh, according to latest news reports, is 32 people killed in the gunfire at the cathedral. And this I hate to say this, but this is a, a story that the cathedral bit is unusual. But you could write this story about Nigeria each weekend, and we have been. We have, Last yeah. week, 20 odd people were killed in Kaduna State, where Muslim Fulani tribesmen are engaged in a war of extermination against Christian farmers, pastoralists versus uh, farmers. The, um, and it happens the pastoralists are Muslims and the farmers are Christians. And the, the herders want the land to graze their cattle because the north is overgrazed and the, and the Saharan desert is moving south. And they move. The, the last news we have was in Kaduna State, uh, which is uh, where Ben Kwashi, the Gafcon uh, uh, general secretary, uh, was bishop for many years and is now retired and he lives there. You know, they came into a village, shot it up, murdered Pete, murdered women and children, burned it down, and they murdered them with machetes. Um, this is genocide. This is, you know, the targeting of a people for a specific attribute. Mm-hmm. In this case, it's religion. You know, we're, the Muslim villagers aren't being murdered. Different Muslim villages aren't being attacked. It's the Christians. And the Nigerian government really does nothing for these people. Well, in any other time, this would have been news. Um, We are dealing with a news that's hung up on Trump derangement syndrome. They're covering everything except news. In fact, if the Christians were killing Muslims in these countries, that would have been news. But this is just like, hey, shootings in Chicago, 14 dead over the weekend in Chicago. It's news that's out there, but the large organizations like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and others, just ignore it. Even the BBC barely covers this type of stuff. Oh, I mean, for the New York Times, it's a bigger story that Baron Trump, Trump's uh, son going into ninth grade, that his school is closing for the fall because of the coronavirus. That's a bigger news story than uh, a dozen people getting murdered in Chicago each weekend in gunfire. Hmm. I mean, wh- what... What possible interest is it to the United States that Baron Trump's private school has chosen not to reopen compared to the death of young black men? And they're all black men who are being murdered in Chicago by other black men. And Black Lives Matter don't matter when it's politically inconvenient. That's correct. I mean, it's very frustrating as a journalist to watch this, to see that... uh, you know, important news is being ignored and progressive news is being uh, propagated. Uh, and, and, and we have church leaders like uh, 
Mike, uh, Michael Curry saying the major problem afflicting the United States these days is white supremacy in the environment. I'm sorry, but I just don't see the Ku Klux Klan killing 13, 14 black young men every weekend. No. I don't, that, that's not happening. Nor the storms in, in, in Illinois. It's, it's no, not I don't storms. doubt the existence of nut jobs. No. They're what, 20 odd million people in Florida? Mm -hmm. You're going to find some kooks. I'm sorry. And, you know, one of the staples of the news is Florida man eaten by an alligator. You know, whenever you see the word Florida man, it's the start of some really stupid good redneck is red, somebody who you know, redneck story. We have these people. It's a big place. It's it's but a hold the, my beer story. And and you know, I live in a part of the town where you part of the state where you can see men driving around in pickup trucks with Confederate flags next to uh University of Florida flags. Uh this is old, you know, what whatever. Well, the point is that there is no that the there is no white supremacy in the terms of people thinking that all whites are better than every single black. You've got racists who dislike people, black racists and white racists, but you don't have the problems that Michael Curry talks about. It's you know, nonsense. I've been traveling flyover country for thirty one days now, and I am surprised by how many uh, Trump banners and Trump supports and Trump flags and trump yard signs there are compared to biden signs uh in fact in 31 days i've seen two biden signs uh where if somebody's a trump supporter they mm -hmm. are all trump mm -hmm. um you'll see uh, banners and flags outside their house and trump 2020 and their <clears throat> ford pickup truck has the, <laughs> the the trump stickers you don't see that on the Connecticut coast or the California coast or uh, anywhere else except middle America the, there is support for Trump here I'm not this is not an endorsement this is just telling you observationally what I see and it's not making the news as far as the news is concerned from the east coast and the west coast um, Trump will get one vote in November and Biden will get uh, 300 million and, so. I live in a community where there are guys driving around in pickup trucks with Confederate flags flying. Mm -hmm. That same community, the guys with the Confederate flags flying in the pickup truck with all their buddies in the pickup truck drinking beer in the truck bed. And petting gators. <laughs> that, there's go, they're go, that's going to be a mixed race crowd. Yeah. They're going to be a bunch, you know, you see teenagers at McDonald's. They're not segregated by race. In other words, race is yesterday's divider. It's not a current phenomenon in the culture that we have today. Um, I have a mixed race congregation. I have black staff. I have, you know, it's just not something that is cognizant or that we think about. Well, I think the, the current race baiting is, is largely made up. Um, I let's just play a little American history here. When we had immigrants coming to the East Coast and coming into Ellis Island and coming into New York, <clears throat> they would divide into New York in, by their country. You had the Polacks from Poland, you had the Norwegians, you had the uh, French, you had the Germans, you had the Greeks. They all went into their neighborhoods before they went off into frontier land. And uh, every little enclave and group was racist against the other the french were not friends with other european immigrants sorry just wasn't that way uh nor were the people from poland or from czechoslovakia or from germany uh there were warring gangs in new york um that hated each other not because of their color but because of their nationality and or ethnicity whatever you want to you want to say that's just part of the heritage and, and the powder keg that is america and it, it's foolish to say right now that race and racism is the biggest issue going on out there right now the biggest issue is unemployment people are going to start you know there's only so long this government can support financially giving out $600 checks every week, people are going to start losing their homes, their apartments. There's going to be a large, uh, you know, explosion of homelessness soon. How is the church going to respond to that? 
Are you going to be in a corner just saying, wait, wait, this is all about racism? Or are you going to be helping those who are losing their jobs, losing their income, losing economic stability, their savings, uh, future college funds? Or are you just going to uh, hide in a corner and say, this is just about racism? Well, the institutional church and the Episcopal uh, form of it has already come up with the answer, which is because you're white, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. You deserve to suffer. Uh, they've fully bought into the woke ideology of white supremacy, and and uh, which is, you know, an absolute false historical narrative. It's untrue. Well, but let's be. Uh, it's 16 minutes into the program. I want you guys to listen. To this. Racism exists. It does. But you have to look for it now. It's out there, and nobody on this program is denying it exists. But it's not like it was in the 1950s, 1920s, 1800s. Oh, my God, it was horrible. It's like it is in 2020. It exists, but you have to look for it. It's and not, it's, it just as human sin exists. Yeah, it's yeah, always going to be. Sin is there. It's always yeah. going to be there. Yeah. It's just how we respond and react to it and how we take people forward from those positions through Christian love. Or, through, or do we do it through the... The, the woke perspective of hectoring and demonization. That yep. you're either an anti-racist, meaning you're fully woke, or you're a racist. Well, those categories are not unreal. No, and you, you won't solve this by shaming people. You know, uh, that, that's I mean, the, the I mean, and, you know, and the churches, like the Church of England is on, an, it, Justin Welby is on the white apology tour. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the sins of the past, for... There was a slave-owning priest in the Caribbean 300 years ago that the first African bishop, Ajaya Crowther, was treated badly by other bishops. I mean, does Justin's do does an apology on behalf of somebody else for something that you had nothing to do with mean anything? Or is it just merely a political act of symbolism of virtue signaling that basically absolves you from taking any real action to address the, the, the faults of this age. If you want real action, we need forgiveness. Yes, we need to apologize for the, the, the past, the enmity that is within us as the human race, but we also need forgiveness for those who we've had enmity towards. Um, and until there's forgiveness, all there's gonna be is apology tours, George. Let's move on a little bit. Uh, COVID is still causing date changes. Looks like uh, we're gonna put off um, uh, a few more big events. What's the latest? Oh, General Convention of the Episcopal Church uh, looks like it'll now be pushed from 2021 to 2022. Sydney General Synod is uh, not going to meet this fall in October when it normally meets. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a special synod in March. Um, we're just seeing this across the board. Anglican churches in Zimbabwe had been open. Now they're shutting down again. Um, we're seeing uh, diocese, uh, South African Anglican Church is completely closed. They're going to have one diocese reopen on August 7th. The others aren't expected to open until sometime later in the fall. The second wave, which it seems to be what we're experiencing right now, is prompting closures again. And I think this goes back to what you're uh, describing, Kevin, of the ability to economically withstand and psychologically withstand another period of lockdown. Hmm. I'm not so certain that the economy and the psyche of the nation is ready uh, to hole up in their room again. Uh, no. In fact, I'm ready to liquidate some more stocks because uh, right before COVID hit, we liquidated and uh, rebought in at the bottom. And I think the stock market is going to take another downturn for at least another six months as we have the third wave. And the third wave is going to be horrible because the government's going to st stop spending, sending out checks. And that's going to hurt a lot of people. Um, let's move on quickly before we uh, close out the show. Um, one of my least favorite topics is burning of books. Uh, it's never served societies in the past well. We're now burning Bibles in the Northeast as part of the BL BLM protest. And, uh, you know, I, I find that very disappointing, George. Yes, the uh, 
most notable practice, and it's not restricted to one place, is uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters at the Portland Courthouse, mm -hmm. which, Kevin, as you have pointed out, are overwhelmingly white. Uh, Extremely white. <laughs> these, are, these are not uh, young African-American men, uh, by and large. There are some. There are some. But, but I don't... What was the what was the number? Seventeen uh, percent of those participating in Black Lives Matter protest are of the African African descendant persuasion. Seventeen percent, and remember, folks, the African American population is twelve percent of the United States. Yeah. So, so, so the, the this is predominantly a white middle class liberal phenomena because mm -hmm. these kids need to have somebody pay their way and that's mommy and daddy well at the federal courthouse uh where there have been this violence and these poor saps are saying the the, the peaceful protests remain peaceful as firebombs and incendiary explosives went off um the news is just so dreadful in its reporting at the latest incarnation uh a load of bibles was piled in front of the entrance to the portland courthouse and set alight by the Black Lives Matter protesters. Majority white. Majority white. Majority college educated. Yes, majority liberal. Uh, but in other words, the here, here's the thing that you may, I'm speaking the general you, you may be sympathetic to eradicating racism and improving the absolutely. plight of minorities in this country. Which George and I are. We The organization to... Black Lives Matter mm -hmm is anti-christian anti-american uh marxist that seeks the destruction and overthrow the united states government hawk newsom who's been on tv a number of times who's the black lives matter uh, leader in new york has said that white people must leave the south bronx uh they're now saying this on tv these are segregationists black segregationists they're in the 70s, the black power movement sort of died because it spiraled out of control and in its, in its waning days was noted for a virulent anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that now in Seattle and in Portland where Jewish businesses are being targeted by Black Lives Pro Matter protesters for solely because the owner of the business is Jewish or has a Jewish sounding name. This is... The Antifa, you just need to take out the anti and just leave the fa. That these are fascists. Absolutely. These are anti Semitic yeah. uh, terrorists. And to see Major League Baseball uh, mounds stenciled with BLM, uh, to see uh, uh, the woke capitalism is its own worst enemy. I mean, just like Nike lost almost a billion dollars and Gillette lost multi-billions of dollars when they went woke last year. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we have a Thursday work crew uh, where the older men of our congregation, older in Florida is different from older elsewhere. The, the super senior, so senior years, yes. They get to the church around 6.30 on Thursday morning and drink coffee for an hour. Yeah. Then they play with the power tools, the mowers, the weed whackers, and then for about half hour, and then they drink coffee for another hour. And I go over once every six, seven weeks just to encourage and thank them for the groundskeeping. And when I ever go in the past, the past six, seven years I've gone there, they're always talking about sports, whatever season it is, baseball, football, basketball. Listening today, I had, you know, one guy said, you know, I've been following the, the Redskins since I was a kid. If they don't need me, I don't need them. That's right. I mean, you're just the, the major league sports is destroying its key demographic uh, by basically saying that we don't want you people watching. Uh, and the Episcopal Church is the same way sometimes. Just, we don't want you people attending. That's the dynamic that major league sports never understood. It was always about the fan, never about the athlete. If you can't keep the fans uh satisfied and happy they will go somewhere else there are diehard fans behind me are two of the most diehard packer fans you know there are but they're not going to waste money uh for pol political 
uh, sports. Yeah. And you can take this and apply this to the institutional church in the West, to the Church of England, to the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. The churches now are about the clergy, not about the worshipers. Okay. Certainly they're not about Jesus Christ. Not about God. Yeah. We, we've got uh, two new bishops in the Church of England. Uh, Kevin, you pointed this out. Sure. Neither one of them have ever had any real meaningful parish experience. Uh, they basically have, they're ba basically middle managers who are trained to be middle managers who have no real experience with people. They've done no grunt work. They went to the office of core. They took that realm to, to become a bishop where all the people who are doing the hard grunt work uh, get no respect from the bishops. You know, get fired. And, you know, and that's true. The that's really true. Of the Episcopal Church as well. We have uh, such a disconnect between the uh, off, admit, executive offices in the diocese and in New York, and the church on the ground. And that's one of the reasons why the church has been dying. Um, it just is irrelevant to the lives of the worshippers. It's it's hard. George, kind of a sad show. Talk about death. The economy, but having a relationship in Jesus Christ is much different than having to face these problems uh, with an unsatisfied heart. Uh, we ask that you seek God in all of this, that you pray for those uh, in other countries who are uh, experiencing violence as Christians, uh, and pray for this country. That you know we have seen better days, and we will see better days. And uh, pray and pray for the clergy because so many of them believe that their salvation lies in their status as priests or bishops, yeah. not in their in, non, in saving faith in Jesus Christ. And pray for their reform, for their conversion and renewal. Yeah. Some of the most famous priests and theologians in history became Christians after becoming priests. That can still happen today. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episodes... What is it, Kevin? 614? Oh, it's 614, August 4, something like that. 614. Live. Of Anglican. On script.